I'm Molly Crockett. I'm a neuroscientist at the University of Oxford in the UK. And I'm interested in decision making and specifically the kinds of decisions that involve trade-offs. So for example, trade-offs between my own self-interest and the interests of other people, or trade-offs between my sort of present desires and my future goals. And one thing that's always fascinated me specifically about human decision making is the fact that we have these multiple conflicting motives in our decision process. And not only do we have these different forces pulling us in different directions, but we can reflect on that. We can see, we can witness the sort of tug of war that happens when we're trying to make a sort of difficult decision. And I think about this a lot. And one thing that I think is really great about our ability to reflect on this is that it suggests that we can intervene somehow. We can intervene in our decision process. And we can make better decisions. We can make more self-controlled decisions. We can make more moral decisions. And the reason I become really interested in the brain and the neuroscience of decision making is because I have this sense that if we can sort of pull apart the different moving parts of the process, if we can look under the hood, um, then that will give us clues as to where we might be able to intervene and shape our own decisions. And I think one really, really interesting case study for this is moral decision making. So when we can see that there's a selfish option and we can see that there's an altruistic or a cooperative option, and we can, we can sort of reason our way through, but there are also these gut feelings about what's right and what's wrong. And so I've gotten lately to, to studying the neurobiology of moral decision making and specifically how different chemicals in our brains, neuromodulators, can shape the, the process of, of moral decisions and, and actually push us one way or another way uh, when we're reasoning and, and deciding. So neuromodulators are chemicals in the brain. Um, there are a bunch of different neuromodulator systems um, that serve different functions. But basically what they do is different events out in the world activate these systems. And then they perfuse into different regions of the brain. And they influence the way that information is processed in those different regions. And all of you have experience with neuromodulators. Some of you are drinking cups of coffee right now. Many of you probably had wine with dinner last night. Maybe some of you have other experiences that are a little more interesting. <laughs> um, and, um, but you don't really need to take drugs or alcohol even to influence your neurochemistry. You can also influence your neurochemistry um, through just natural events like, like, like stress influences your, your neurochemistry, sex, exercise, changing your diet. So there are all these things out in the world that sort of feed into our brains through these chemical systems. And I've become really interested in studying in the lab how if we change these chemicals, can we cause changes in people's behavior and their decision making. Now one thing that's really important I think to keep in mind about the effects of these different chemicals on our behavior is that the effect sizes here are, are really, really subtle. The, the effect sizes are really, really small. And so this has sort of two consequences for doing research in this area. The first is because the effect sizes are so small, um, a lot of the published literature on this is, is likely to be underpowered. There are probably a lot of false positives out there. And so, you know, we, we heard earlier there's a lot, of, a lot of, of thought on this in science, not just in psychology, but in all of science, about how we can do better powered experiments and, and how, we can, how we can really create a, a set of data that, that will tell us what's going on. Um, but the other thing, and this is what I've been really interested in, is because the effects of neuromodulators are so subtle, we have to have really, really precise measures in the lab of the kinds of behaviors and decision processes that we're interested in. Because it's only with really precise measures that we're, we're going to be able to pick up on these really subtle effects of brain chemistry, which maybe at the individual level aren't going to make a dramatic difference in someone's personality, but at the aggregate level, in the kinds of of collective behaviors like cooperation and, and sort of uh, public goods problems, these might actually become on the, on the global scale really important. So this is what I've been thinking about really intensely for the past several years, is how can we measure moral decision making in the lab in a really precise way, um, not, uh, not just in, in a way that, that we can sort of agree that this is a moral decision, and this is a really important point, one big challenge in this area is there's a whole lot of disagreement about what constitutes a moral behavior. What is moral? We, we, we heard earlier that, that you know, something like cooperation, maybe some people think that's a moral decision, but maybe other people don't. And that's, that's a real issue for getting people to cooperate. Um, so first, we have to really pick a behavior that, that we can all agree is moral. But secondly, we want to measure it 
in a way that tells us something about the mechanism. We want to have these really rich uh, sets of data that, that, that tell us about these different moving parts, these different pieces of the puzzle, so then we can go in and, and see which, uh, how they map differently onto different parts of the brain, different chemical systems, and so on and so forth, so we can understand um, how this process works. And so what I'm going to do over the next 20 minutes or so is sort of take you through my thought process over the past several years because I've tried a bunch of different ways of measuring the effects of neurochemistry on what at one point I think is moral decision making but then it turns out maybe is not the best way to measure morality and sort of show you how I've, I've tried to zoom in on, on better measures and, and, and more advanced and sophisticated ways of measuring the kinds of, of cognitions and emotions that we really care about in this context. So when I started this work several years ago, um, I was interested in punishment. And I was interested in, in sort of economic games that you can use to measure punishment. So if someone treats you unfairly, then you can spend a bit of money to take money away from them. And I was interested specifically in the effects of a brain chemical called serotonin on punishment. Um, but I think that actually the issues that I'll talk about here aren't really specific to serotonin, but really apply to this bigger question of how can we change moral decision making. And when I started this work, sort of the prevailing view about punishment was that punishment was a moral behavior, a sort of moralistic or altruistic punishment, that you're suffering a cost to enforce a social norm, and this is for, you know, for the greater good, and so on and so forth. And it turned out that serotonin was a really interesting chemical to be studying in this context, because serotonin has this really long tradition of being associated with pro-social behavior. So if you boost serotonin function, this makes people more pro-social. If you deplete or impair serotonin function, this makes people antisocial. And so if you go by the logic of, well, punishment is a moral thing to do, and then you enhance serotonin, that should increase punishment, what we actually see in the lab is the opposite effect. So if you increase serotonin, people punish less. If you decrease serotonin, people punish more. And so that kind of throws, throws a bit of a spanner in, in, in the works of this, this idea that punishment is this exclusively sort of pro-socially minded thing. Um, and, and that kind of makes sense, I think, if you just sort of introspect into the, the kinds of motivations that you go through. If someone treats you unfairly and you punish them, like, I don't know about you guys, but when that happens to me, I'm not thinking about, like, enforcing a social norm of the greater good. I'm thinking, like, I just want that guy to suffer. <laughs> like, <laughs> I just want him to feel bad because he made me feel bad. And so I think that the, the neurochemistry adds a really interesting layer to this bigger question because it sort of, in some ways, like, it's a bit of an objective way to look at it. Like, like serotonin doesn't have a research agenda. It's just, it, it is a chemical. It is what it is. And so we had all this data and we started thinking differently about, about the motivations of, of so-called altruistic punishment. And that actually inspired a purely behavioral study where we basically give people the opportunity to punish those who behave unfairly towards them, but, but we, we do it in two conditions. And one is the sort of standard where um, someone behaves unfairly to someone else and then, and then that person can punish them and uh, it's all sort of full information and the guy who's unfair knows that he's being punished. But then we added another condition that was, that was really kind of interesting, which is um, we give people the opportunity to punish kind of in secret, um, a hidden punishment. Um, so you can punish someone without them knowing that they've been punished. They still suffer a loss financially, but because we obscure the financial, um, the, the stake, we obscure the size of the stake, then the guy who's being punished doesn't actually know he's being punished. So the punisher gets the satisfaction of knowing that the bad guy is getting less money, but there's no norm being enforced there. And what we find is that people actually still punish quite a lot in this case. Um, and, and, and even though people will punish a little bit more when when they know that the guy who's being punished will know that he's being punished. People do care a bit about, about norm enforcement. Really a lot of punishment behavior can be explained by this sort of desire to see that, just to know that he's, that he's gonna have a lower payoff in the end. So this suggests that, that punishment is potentially actually a really bad way to study morality because the motivations behind, behind punishment actually are, are in large part, a, a very spiteful thing. So, so we sort of shifted gears here. An another, another method or set of methods that we've used to look at morality in the lab and how it's shaped by neurochemistry is um, trolley problems, so the sort of uh, bread and butter of moral psychology research. Uh, so scenarios where people are asked to read um, 
vignettes and, and, and whether it's morally acceptable to, for example, harm one person in order to save many, many others. And we do find effects of, of neuromodulators on these, on these scenarios, and, and, and they're very interesting in their own right. But I found, I found this, this, this tool sort of unsatisfying for the question that I'm really interested in, which is how do people make moral decisions that have consequences, and it's their decision, and, and, and this is happening in real time rather than in some sort of hypothetical situation. Um, and, and, and equally a bit unsatisfied with economic games as a tool for studying moral decision making because it's not clear that there's really a salient moral norm in something like cooperation in a public goods game or charitable giving in a dictator game. Like it's, it's not clear that people feel guilty if, if they choose a self selfish option um, in, in some cases. Like this, this doesn't seem to be universal. So after all this, I've really gone back to the drawing board and, and tried to think about sort of what what is the essence of morality? And, and there's been some really interesting um, work on this in recent years. So one, one really wonderful paper is, uh, is, is by Kurt Gray and Leanne Young and Adam Waits. And it, and it basically argues that, that the essence of morality is, is harm, and specifically intentional interpersonal harm. So an agent is harming a patient. And of course, morality is more than this. Absolutely, morality is more than this. But I think it will be hard to find a moral code that doesn't include some prohibition against harming someone else um, unless you have a really good reason to do that. So what I wanted to do was to create a measure in the lab that can really precisely quantify how much people dislike causing interpersonal harms. And so what we came up with was basically um, getting people to make trade-offs between personal profits, money, and, um, and pain in the form of electric shocks that are given to another person. And so what we can do with this method is, is basically calculate or, or compute or extract um, in monetary terms how much people dislike harming others. And we, we can fit computational models to their decision process that, that give us a really rich picture of how people make these kinds of decisions. So not just how much harm they're willing to deliver or not, but also sort of what is the precise value they place on the harm of others relative to, for example, harm to themselves. Um, what is the sort of relative certainty or uncertainty with which they're making those decisions? How noisy are their choices? Um, if we're dealing with monetary gains or losses, like how does loss aversion factor into this? And so we can get this really interesting, uh, more detailed picture of the data and of the decision process from using methods like these, which are really largely inspired by non-social, work on non-social decision making in computational neuroscience, where quite a lot of progress has been made in recent years in working out for example, in foraging environments, how do people decide whether to go you know, left or right when you have these sort of fluctuating reward contingencies in the environment? And so what we're really doing is kind of importing those methods to the study of moral decision making. And, and a lot of interesting stuff has come out of it. So um, as you might expect, there's, of course, a lot of individual variation in, in decision making in this setting. So some people really care a lot about about avoiding harm to others, and, and other people are like, just show me the money, like, I don't care about the other person. Um, I even had one subject who um, was almost certainly on the psychopathy scale, and um, when I explained to him what he had to do, he said, wait, you're going to pay me to shock people? This is the best experiment ever. So, <laughs> so you know, whereas other people are really uncomfortable and, and are, are even a bit distressed, distressed by this. So I think as, this is capturing something really interesting um, and, and, and really real uh, about moral decision making. Um, one, people that one thing that we're seeing in the data is, is that people who seem to be really averse to harming others um, actually are, are slower when they're making their decisions. And this is a really interesting contra contrast to, to Dave's work, um, where the more pro-social people are, are, are faster. And of course, there are all sorts of issues that we need to work out about sort of correlation versus causation in, in, in response times and decision making. Um, but I think there are some really interesting questions here um, in, in, in thinking about the differences between a harm context and a helping context. And, and it may be that the sort of heuristics that play out in a helping context come from sort of learning about what is good and, and, and latch onto these neurobiological systems that approach rewards and, and get invigorated when there are awards around, um, in contrast to neurobiological systems that avoid punishments and kind of slow down or freeze 
when there are punishments around. Um, so there are a whole lot of interesting questions there. But I think in the context of trade-offs between sort of profit for myself and pain for someone else, it makes sense that people who are just going for the profit for themselves are going to be faster because if you're, if you're going to consider the harm to someone else, like that's an extra computational step that you have to take. If you're going to factor in someone else's suffering, the negative externality of your decision, you actually have to do that computation and that's going to take a little bit of time. So in this broader question of sort of the time course of moral decision making, there might be kind of an interesting sweet spot where on the one hand, if you, if you have an established sort of heuristic of helping, that's going to make you faster, but at the same time, Considering others is, is also a, a step that requires some extra processing. And, and, and I think this makes sense. And I, you know, when I was actually developing this work, I was, I was in London and I was walking down the street um, with my phone, checking my phone, of course, as we all do. And this kid on a bike in a hoodie like, comes by and tries to grab my phone, tries to steal my phone. And, he luckily didn't get it. It just kind of crashed to the floor, so he was an incompetent thief. But um, in thinking about sort of what his thought process was during that time, like I don't think he was thinking about me at all. He had his eye on the prize. He had his eye on the phone. He was thinking about his reward. He wasn't thinking about the suffering that, that I would feel if I lost my phone, so on and so forth. And so I think there's just sort of a, a, a broader question to think about um, in terms of like the, the input to mental, of, of mentalizing to, to moral decision making. Um, another interesting observation that we see is that um, people who are nicer in, the, in this setting seem to be more uncertain in their decision making. Um, if you look at the parameters that describe uncertainty, um, you can see that sort of people who are nicer seem to be more, um, more noisy around their indifference point. So they're, they're, they're sort of more wavering in these difficult decisions. And, so I've, I've been thinking a lot about uncertainty and its relationship to, to altruism and, and social decision making more generally. Um, and, and I think one, one, really, one really potentially fruitful line of thought is that social decisions, decisions that affect other people, always will have this inherent element of uncertainty because even if we're a really, really good mentalizer, even if we're the best possible mentalizer, we're never going to fully, fully know what it is like to be someone else and how another person is going to experience the effects of our actions on them. And so one thing that we might do, one thing that it might make sense to do if we want to sort of, uh, if we want to coexist peacefully is, is we sort of simulate how our behavior is going to affect them um, but we err on the side of caution. So we don't want to impose a, a, an unbearable cost on someone else. And so we think, well, I might, I might, I might dislike this, this outcome a certain amount, but maybe my interaction partner is going to dislike it a little bit more. And so I'm just going to, I'm just going to add a little bit of extra safety, um, a, a, a margin of error that's that, that's going to move me in the pro-social social direction. Um, and I, th I, I think we're, we're seeing this in the context of pain, but I think this could apply to any sort of cost. So um, for example, risk or, or time cost. So um, just a little thought experiment, like imagine that you have a friend who's trying to decide between two medical procedures. And one medical procedure um, uh, produces like the, the, the most desirable outcome, but it also has like a high complication or a high mortality rate. Um, and then another procedure like doesn't achieve as good of an outcome, but it's, it's much safer. Um, and suppose your friend says to you, um, I want you to choose which procedure I'm going to have. Like, I, I, I want you to choose for me. And, and first of all, I think most of us would be very uncomfortable making that decision for someone else. But second of all, my, my intuition is that, is that um, I would definitely go for the safer option because if something bad happened in the risky decision, like I would feel terrible. And so I, I think this is something that, that can be explored. Um, and, and this idea that we can't really access directly someone else's utility function, um, it's actually a, a, a rather old idea, and it goes back to the 1950s, actually, the, the work of John Harsanyi, um, who, who did some work um, on what he called interpersonal utility comparisons. Um, so how do you compare one person's utility to another person's utility? Um, and, and this problem is really, really important, particularly in utilitarian ethics, because if you want to maximize the greatest good for the greatest number, you have to have some way of measuring the greatest good for each of those 
numbers. And, and the challenge of doing this was, was recognized by the father of utilitarianism, uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Bentham, um, who said that it's vain to talk of adding quantities which, after the addition, will continue to be as distinct as they were before. One man's happiness will never be another man's happiness. You might as well pretend to add 20 apples to 20 pears. And this problem, I think, uh, has still not been solved. So Harsanyi has done a lot of really great work on this. But, but what he ended up with, his final solution, was still an approximation that basically assumes that people have perfect empathy, which we know is not to be the case. Um, so there's still a lot of uh, room in, in this area, I think, for exploration. The other thing about uncertainty, though, is that on the one hand, it could lead us towards social behavior. But on the other hand, I think there's a lot of evidence that uncertainty about outcomes and about how other people react to those outcomes um, can actually license selfish behavior. So uh, uncertainty can also be exploited for personal gain, for self-serving interests. So you know, imagine you're the CEO of a company. You're trying to decide whether to lay off some workers in order to increase shareholder value. Um, and if you want to sort of do the cost-benefit analysis, you have to calculate, well, what's the negative utility for the workers of losing their jobs, and how does that compare to the positive utility of the shareholders for getting these profits? And because you can't directly access how the workers are going to feel, how the shareholders are going to feel, there's a whole lot of space for self-interest to creep in, um, particularly if there are personal incentives to push you one direction or the other. And there's some really nice work that has been done initially on this by Roberto Weber and Jason Dana, who have basically shown that if you put people in situations where outcomes are ambiguous, people will use this to their advantage to sort of make the selfish decision, but, but still sort of preserving their self-image as being a moral person. And so I think this is going to be a really important question to address, is when does uncertainty lead to pro-social behavior, because we don't want to impose an unbearable cost on someone else, and when does it lead to selfish behavior because we can convince ourselves that it's not going to be that bad? So these are just some of the questions I've been asking myself lately, and these are the kinds of things that we want to be able to measure in the lab um, and, and to be able to map different brain processes, different neurochemical systems onto these different parameters that all feed into a decision. And I think that we're going to see a lot of progress over the next um, several years because in the sort of non-social computational neuroscience, there are a lot of very smart people who are making great progress in, in, in sort of mapping out how basic decisions work. And then all people like me have to do is sort of import those to these more complex social decisions. And, and, and so I think there's going to be a lot of low-hanging fruit in this, in this area over the next few years. So just to sort of sum up um, and, and, and broadening out, like once we figure out how all this works, and, and I do think it's going to be a while. Like I, I, I've, I've, I've been misquoted sometimes about saying like, uh, you know, morality pills are just around the corner. I assure you that this is not the case. Like it's going to be a very long time before we're able to intervene in moral behavior. And, and that, that day may never even come. And I think the reason why this is such a complicated problem is because Working out how the brain does this is actually the easy part. The hard part is what to do with that. And this is a philosophical issue. This is a philosophical question. Um, if we figure out how all the moving parts work, then the question is, well, should we intervene? And if so, how should we intervene? Um, so you know, imagine we could develop a really precise drug that sort of just totally uh, amplifies people's aversion to harming others. So you know, you won't. You won't hurt a fly. You know, everyone becomes kind of like like Buddhist monks or something. Um, who should take this drug, right? Only convicted criminals, people who have who have committed violent crimes. Should we put it in the water supply? Like these are these are normative questions. These are questions about what should be done. And 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 I feel just grossly unprepared to answer these questions um, with the training that I have. But I think these are important conversations to have uh, between disciplines and and you know psychologists and neuroscientists need to be talking to philosophers about this. And, and, and these are conversations that we need to have because we don't want to get to the point where we have the technology and then we haven't had this conversation because then you know terrible things could happen, so on and so forth. Um, the last thing that I'll say is, is I think it's also really interesting to think about the implications of this work, the fact that 
that we can shift around people's morals by giving them drugs? Like, what are the Im implications of, of this data for our understanding of what morality is, right? So we know, and there's a lot of, there's, there's increasing evidence now that, you know, you give people testosterone or influence their serotonin or oxytocin or whatever, like, this is going to shift the way they make moral decisions. Not in a dramatic way, in a subtle way, but in a significant way. And so that, that then suggests that because our levels and our function of neuromodulators are changing all the time in response to events in our environment, then that means that sort of circumstances can play a role in sort of how, what you think is right and what you think is wrong. And I, I think many people may find this to be deeply uncomfortable because we like to think of our morals as being core to who we are and one of the most stable things about us. We like to think of them as being sort of written in stone. And if this is not the case, then what are the implications of that for understanding of, of sort of who we are and, 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 and what, what we should think about um, in terms of enforcing norms in society? Um, and, and, and maybe you might think, well, the solution is we should just try to make our moral judgments from a neutral, like, like the placebo condition of life, right? But, but that doesn't exist, right? You know, our, our brain chemistry is shifting all the time. And so it's this very kind of unsteady ground that we, we can't find our footing on. And, and I find that just sort of totally fascinating, but also really humbling. Um, and, and, and so that's, that's sort of, at the end of the day, like how I, how I, I try to avoid being a really arrogant scientist who's like, I can measure morality in the lab. And, you know, no, like, like I have deep respect for sort of the, the, the instability of, of these things. And, and uh, these are conversations that, that I find just deeply fascinating. So um, I had a question um, um, about how you want to think about these philosophical issues about um, maybe some, sometimes they get described as you know, autonomy, right? And yeah. um, so you said, well, you know, what do we put, you know, do we put, if we could discover some kind of chemical that would you know, improve people's sort of moral capacities, do we put it in the water? And the question I have is a little bit related to the thing you said about imaginabil imaginability, when, you know, in other words, the guy who tried to steal your phone, you know, the thought was, well, if he were somehow better able to imagine how I would really respond, that he would somehow make a, maybe a better moral judgment. Mm -hmm. And um, there's an interesting issue there about um, a kind of normative versus descriptive question there, mm -hmm. because on the one hand, it might be easier to justify putting the drug in the water if it made people somehow better at grasping true moral facts. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. But right. what if it just made them better at imagining various kinds of scenarios so that they acted in a moral in, in a morally better way? But in fact, <laughs> it had no kind of connection at all to reality. It just kind of made their behavior better. Mm -hmm. So it seems like it's important to make that distinction. Yeah. Um, even with the work that you're doing, namely, are you focusing on how people actually act, or are you focusing on the kind of psychological facts, and which one are we prioritizing, which one are we using to just justify whatever kinds of policy implications? Yeah, well, I, I think this sort of goes back a little bit to the question of do we want to be psychologists or economists if, yeah, we're, if we're confronted with a, with a worldly, <laughs> uh, all-powerful being, and, and, and I think I, 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 ha I am, am falling squarely in the sort of psychologist camp in that, in that it's so important to understand the motivations behind why people do the things they do because if you change the context then people might behave differently. If you're just observing behavior and you don't know why, um, then, then you could make incorrect predictions. But, but back to your question, um, one, one thought that pops up is, is I think it's a lot less controversial to, it's potentially less controversial to enhance capabilities that people sort of think about as giving them more competence in the world. Can I just follow up? So, so yeah. there's interesting work on organ donors in particular, and it turns oh, yeah. out that yeah. um, 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 when, when people are kind of recruiting um, possible organ donors, so they're looking at the families who have to make the decision, yeah. it turns out that um, encouraging these um, potential, the families of the potential donors, to imagine that, you know, their, the daughter who was killed in a car accident, well, the recipient of the organ will actually be, you know, also 17 and loves oh, horses yeah. and blah, blah, blah. Now, in <laughs> fact, there can be, you know, it could just be like some dude with a drug problem yeah. who's yeah. going to get the organ. Yeah. But the family 
the, the 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 measured results of the of the of the of the do, of the donating family are yeah. much better if that family engages in this kind of fictitious imaginative thing, yeah. even though it has no connection at all to the truth. Mm. And so it's not always simple. In other words, the moral questions sometimes come up apart from yeah. Um, yeah. Mm. The, like, yeah, absolutely. The desired empirical result. Yeah, no, that's that's totally true. And I think I think <coughs> one one way that that psychologists and neuroscientists can contribute to this this discussion is is to be as sort of um, specific and precise as possible um, in in sort of understanding how to shape motivation versus how to just shape choices. And, and I don't have a good answer about what is the right thing to do um, in this case, but I agree that is an important question. I have a good answer to what you should <laughs> 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 um, but this theme uh, was something that I think was emerging at the end with uh, Dave's talk as well about about sort of promoting behavior versus like, understanding the mechanisms. Yeah. But there is even within even if you are a psychologist and you have just a real interest in this, uh, I think there is a way in which uh, in the in the mechanisms there's a way in which you could say I'm going to be like a uh, the, just take the B. F. Skinner's learning approach and say. What I care about is essentially the frequency of the behavior. What what are the things that I have to do to promote uh, to promote the behavior that I want to promote? And you know you get this this sort of you know nice sort of manipulate the contingencies in the environment and between reward and punishment. You you say well does reward work better than punishment? And um, and so I I want maybe propose that we have two very good intuitions, one which should be discarded when we're being social scientists. One is, what do we want our kids to be? So I want my kid to be good for the right reasons. In other words, I want her to develop a character that I can be proud of and that she can be proud of, and I want her to donate uh, to charity, not because she's afraid that if she doesn't, people will judge her poorly, but because she genuinely cares about other people. When I'm looking at society, and the more and more work that we that we do that might have implications for society, I think we should set aside those concerns. That is, we we should be comfortable saying that there is one question about what the right reasons are and what the right motivations are from a moral sense, and there's just another one that should say, from say a public policy perspective, what will maximize the welfare of my society and. I can give a rat's ass why. Yeah. Like why people are doing it. If you're doing it because you're ashamed, like Jennifer might talk about, like because I, I want to sign up for the energy program because I will get mocked by my peers. <laughs> or if you're doing it because you realize that like actually this is your your calling that God gave to you, right? To like insert this little temperature reducer during, <laughs> during like California <laughs> summer. Um, that, that a by any means necessary approach <laughs> that seems that seems so inhuman to us as individuals mm -hmm. is actually a perfectly appropriate strategy to use uh, when we're making yeah. decisions for for the public. Yeah, no, I th I think that that makes sense, and it's sort of a satisfying approach rather than a maximizing approach, and 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 I I think one reason why we care about the first intuition so much is because in the context in which we evolved, which is sort of small group interactions, like someone who does a good thing for the right reasons is just going to be more reliable and more trustworthy over time than someone who does it for an externally incentivized reason. But that doesn't, that doesn't mean that we should just be like, all right. <laughs> and it may not be true, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It may turn out to be wrong. Yeah. I, think that, I, I think that that's totally right, but I think that that's still true. That it's not just about when you're in small group hunter gatherer or whatever, mm -hmm. but it's like in general, if you believe something for the right reason, then you'll do it even if no one is watching, yeah. and that creates a more socially optimal outcome than if you only do it when someone is watching. It's an empirical question, though, right? I mean, I, and I don't know if it's answered, right? Because, for instance, the fear of punishment. We have data actually of a flavor that, like, if you look at people that cooperate in repeated prisoners' dilemmas. Mm -hmm. They are no more or less likely to cooperate in one shot, uh, or they're no more likely to give in a dictator game. Basically, you can set up rules that like will make uh, that is basically when the rules in place, everybody cooperates regardless of whether they're selfish or not. But when no incentive is there, the selfish people go back to being selfish. There's also data that um, in news agents in the UK, sometimes you can uh, take a newspaper and put money in, in the slot and. If you put a couple of eyes above the money slot, 
people are more likely to pay their dues than if you don't put any eyes there. So the idea is that if you know these fake eyes that's certainly not the right reason. To yeah. <laughs> 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 that can't be the right reason. Well, there were no eyes there. I, yeah. I mean. <laughs> The other thing that I wanted to say about uh, what you, you were talking about more generally was that I think that there's there you were bringing up the issue of like thinking about the consequences for yourself versus the other person, and I think that when uh, when we're thinking about how these decisions get made, there are sort of two stages that are distinct but that get lumped together a lot in terms of conceptually and measurement wise. Where one is you have to understand what the options are, and then once you know what the options are you have to choose which one you prefer. And so it seems to me that the sort of like automatic versus deliberative processing has opposite roles in those two yeah. domains, right? Where obviously to understand the problem, you have to think about it. Yeah. Uh, and so if you're just totally selfish, you don't need to spend that time to think yeah. about the decision yeah, yeah, yeah. because it's obvious what to do. Where, but whereas, uh, and so like in a lot of what we do, we try to separate those things right. by totally explaining the decision beforehand when you're not yeah, constrained. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when it comes time to actually make the decision, you put people under pressure. Yeah, I think that I think that that can totally explain sort of what's going on. And, and, and that's a really, really good point, because um, the, the these ideas about about uncertainty and sort of moral wiggle room, I think those are, are going to play the biggest role in, in the first part, in the construing of the problem. Is this a moral decision or is it not a moral decision? And potentially also playing the biggest role in, in, in this idea you were talking about earlier about, about how do people internalize what is the right thing to do? Like how do you, how do you establish um, that this is the right thing to do? And, and, and so we should talk more about this because I think, I think methodologically this is really important yeah. to separate out. Um, can, I, can, I say, sorry, can I say something about this, this, issue, this issue of mentalizing? I think you're right in, in drawing attention to the importance of mentalizing in, in making moral decisions or moral judgments. And it's true that uh, it's, I mean, it seems that the data indicate that we're not very good at it, that you know, we have biases and we tend to not be very charitable when we, uh, when, we, when we think about what might have caused other people's behavior. And I think the reason is that uh, in everyday life, as, 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 as um, as contrasted with uh, many experimental settings, most experimental settings, we can talk to people. So right. you know, I don't, I don't have to. When you, if you do something that I think is bad, and we know, we know that data from 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 how people can when people explain themselves, that spontaneously you're gonna tell me why you did this, and you're gonna try to you know disculpate yeah. yourself. So I don't have to do the work of, uh, <laughs> I don't have to do the work of trying to figure out you know why you did this, you know what kind of excuse might might, might you might uh, you might have had, because you're gonna do it for me. And and then we set up these experiments in which you don't have this feedback, and it's just weird. I mean it's not irrelevant because there are many situations in which you know that happens as well, but we still have to keep in mind that it is unnatural and that yeah. basically I mean in, in most of these games and most of these experiments if you could just list, if you could just let people talk. They find a good solution. Like even in, in the thing with the with the shocks, if the people could talk with each other, you could say, "Well, okay, I'm gonna, I'm happy to take that much shock, and they will share the money or something like that." Yeah. And it's just, I mean, then again, I'm not saying it's it's not interesting to do the experiments at all, but uh, we have to keep in mind that it's kind of weird. In some I ways. think that's true to a certain extent, and I think a lot of a lot of moral decisions, particularly in the cooperation domain, out in the real world, um, do usually involve some sort of communication. But I think increasingly a lot of, of moral decisions actually are individual in the sense they involve someone that's not there. If you're deciding whether to buy a product that is fair trade or not, or if you're, if you're a politician making a decision about a health policy that's going to affect you know, hundreds, thousands of people, millions of people who are not there, like, I think a lot of really, really important, but you know, potentially some of the most wide-reaching moral decisions are actually made by an individual who does not see those who are going to bear the consequences of that decision. So, so I think it's important to study both. Yeah, but I guess is that maybe by, by realizing that the, the context in which these mechanisms of mentalizing evolved is one in which you had a huge amount of feedback that can, make, that can help us to better understand what happens when, when, we, don't, when we don't have this feedback. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and maybe, that, maybe that's why we, we see selfish behavior is that we're used to having an opportunity to justify it. Um, when, when now there are many cases in which you actually don't have to justify it. I wanted to j jump in. And one of the things that's really unique and cool about your research is the focus on neuromodulators, whereas most research on how the brain processes morality has been on neural computation. Yeah. Obviously, those things are interrelated. Yeah. 
And I guess I've always been, a, I don't know if confused is the right word, about what neuromodulators are for. So it seems like mm -hmm. neural computation can be incredibly precise. You could get like a Surat or a Vermeer out of neural computation, yeah. mm -hmm. whereas neuromodulators give you Rothko's and, <laughs> you know, Pollock's. Oh, and <laughs> so what, why does the brain have such blunt tools? And how does thinking about neuromodulators in particular as a very blunt tool, but also a very wide ranging one, inform your thought about their role in moral judgment as opposed, again, to, to sort of neural computation? Yeah. Okay, so first I think it's important to distinguish between the tools we have as researchers for manipulating neuromodulators, which are incredibly, incredibly blunt. Like, so, so blunt. Um, versus the way that these systems work in the brain, which are extremely precise. Like, the serotonin system, for example, has at least 17 different kinds of receptors. And those receptors do different things and they're distributed differentially in the brain. So some types of receptors are only found sort of subcortically and other receptors have their highest concentration in like the medial prefrontal cortex, for example. So there's actually a, a very, very high degree of precision in how these chemicals can influence brain processing in, in more local circuits. But to answer the first part of your question, the function of these systems is is because we, you know, cog cognition is not really a one size fits all kind of kind of program. Sometimes you want to be, you know, more focused on sort of local details at the exclusion of of the bigger picture. Other times you want to be able to look at the bigger picture at the exclusion of small details, and whether you want to be processing in one way or the other is going to depend. Um, is, is going to depend profoundly on the environmental context. So if you're in a very stressful situation, you want to be focusing your attention on how to, how to get out of that situation. You don't want to be thinking about like what you're going to have for breakfast tomorrow. And, and, and you know, conversely, if, if, if things are, are really chilled out, then that's the time when you can sort of engage in long-term planning. And so, so there's, there's evidence that, that Things like stress, environmental events, it, you know, events that, that have some sort of um, important uh, consequence for the survival of the organism are going to activate these systems, which then shape cognition in such a way that's adaptive. And so that's, that's the way that, that I think about neuromodulators. Now, serotonin is really, really interesting in this context because it's one of the least well understood um, in, in, terms of, you know, in terms of how this works. So the, the sort of stress example, I was mainly talking about like noradrenaline and cortisol, and, and those neuromodulators are, are understood fairly well. Noradrenaline sort of, it's stimulated by stress and it increases sort of the signal to noise ratio in the prefrontal cortex and it, it really focuses your attention. Serotonin does, does tons of different things, but one kind of crazy idea about serotonin um, that, that I've been thinking about lately is that serotonin is one of the very few, if not the only, major neuromodulator um, that can only be synthesized if you continually have nutritional input. Um, so you make serotonin from tryptophan, which is an amino acid that you can only get from the diet. You can only get it from, from eating foods that have tryptophan, um, which is most foods, but especially high protein foods. Um, and so if you're in a famine, you're not going to be making as much serotonin. And, and, and this is interesting in an evolutionary context because when does it make sense to cooperate and, and care a lot about the welfare of your fellow beings? Like, you know, when resources are abundant, then that's when you should be building relationships. When resources are scarce, maybe you want to be looking out for, for yourself, although there's some really interesting um, sort of uh, wrinkles in there that, that Dave and I have talked about before where, where there could be a sort of inverted U-shaped function where, where cooperation is critical in times of stress. But, but perhaps one function of serotonin is, is to shape our social preferences in such a way that's adaptive to the current sort of environmental context.